So with that, if it's okay, let me introduce the panel and then I'll put them to work. Um, so to my far right is Ramsey Ravenel. Uh, Ramsey is the President and Chief Investment Officer of the Grantham Foundation for the Protection of the Environment. You heard his boss, Jeremy Grantham, who's sitting in the back of the room, so be careful what you say, Ramsey. Um, so Ramsey, uh, investor in 60 plus uh, deals here. Noah Deitch is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Carbon Management in the Office, in the office of Fossil Fuel Energy and Carbon Management of the Department of Energy, um, and so representing the government. And then we have two entrepreneurs. Laura Lammers is the founder and CEO of Travertine Technologies, and then Marty Odlin is the founder and CEO of Running Tide. So to you two, because you invest in most of these technologies, or Noah, you kind of worry about all of them, can you just give the audience a bit of a primer? When we talk about CDR, there's lots of different kinds of technologies. Just orient them about what we're talking about. That would be a great place to start. Great, thank you, Peter. Um, and maybe I'll start and, and Noah can fill in. Um, and I'll try to uh, avoid the use of acronyms, but uh, Peter just mentioned CDR, which is industry shorthand for carbon dioxide removal. Uh, and and we'll, we'll try to steer out of, stay out of that soup. Uh, but as we started to think about this, this approach, and uh, we really laid it out uh, in, in four broad technology categories, and in very simple terms, they are industrial, uh, industrial systems uh, that we generally have focused on direct air capture, although some might include um, flue gas capture um, with that, so industrial systems. Um, the second category we, we called harnessing photosynthesis, which was meant to be a very broad tent uh, to include um, agricultural practices that might sequester soils and carbon, forestry practices that would store carbon in soils or trees, um, uh, and as well as biotech uh, strategies around uh, growing algae or, or other kinds of uh, biological approaches. Uh, the third category for us was uh, geological approaches, either sequestering it underground in reservoirs uh, or um, uh, more on the frontier mineralization using different kinds of rocks either sequestering it in situ underground or working with mine tailings um, or or other types of rocks to bind it up as a mineral in a more permanent way and then the last category for us was uh, generally ocean oriented approaches such as ocean alkalinity enhancement and and various other uh, ocean-related strategies. So that was our kind of broad landscape, and we've been active across all four of those sectors. Uh, anything you'd add, Noah? Yeah, I would just step back and say all that that mapping is great. What we're trying to do is move carbon molecules from the atmosphere back into the biosphere and keep them there. So we're agnostic as to how you do that, as long as you do that at scale and do so in a way that's permanent and additional. And additional, meaning that it wouldn't have happened without human intervention. Great, um, and so you're gonna hear mineralization, I think, would be in that bucket, and ocean-based solutions would be in this bucket, so. Um, but we don't have DAC and point source and some other things on the panel. So you've got a range of technologies represented here. And I don't know, Laura, if you wanna add any scientific kind of, because she, Laura <laughs> said that if we needed the science here, she could actually add it in. Well, I, I think that was a really good description of the categories, but the background on that from a geochemical perspective, biogeochemical perspective, is that we've done a lot of fundamental science to understand the carbon cycle. We understand the pools and fluxes and all of those levers, so the biosphere, the oceans, uh, and the geosphere, so rocks and minerals, are the way that the Earth naturally pulls CO2 out of the air and sequesters it over various time scales, and so we want to actually take advantage of those natural, very large magnitude, so gigaton per year scale fluxes that are already in existence. And again, feel free to ask questions, because, you know, based on what I can see, a lot of you are here to learn about this, so, you know, want to make this as useful as possible. So, Noah, why is there an office in the DOE, why is there a new office, I think, in the DOE to worry about remo carbon dioxide removal? Yeah, it's a great question, and the reason that we have an office at the Department of Energy is because carbon removal is a key piece of the United States climate strategy, which is really exciting because that is a very new development. Historically, this has been very much in the provenance of kind of billionaire investors and philanthropists, but only in the past few years 
has the U.S. government finally caught up to what the rest of the innovation community has seen for the past decade and longer in some cases, and have started to pass significant policy associated with the full range of carbon removal technologies. Our office in particular is focused on an energy earth shot that Secretary Granholm announced almost two years ago now, focused at the carbon negative shot sets a goal of $100 a ton carbon removal within a decade that is scalable to the levels that were mentioned that are going to move the needle for the climate. And this is really modeled after the sunshot effort of a decade ago, where we knew solar energy had immense potential. It just costs literally 100 times what it does today. And so how do we spark that innovation that's necessary to take technology that has massive potential but is currently too expensive or inefficient for some reason and drive it down a learning curve in the same way that we have seen for not just solar now, but wind, batteries, um, electrolyzers are following the same curve. We, we've seen this happen over and over again in the clean energy space, and we need to see that happen in the carbon removal space. And so our office is focused on that broader innovation challenge couple of follow-up questions. You said the goal is to get it down to 100 or less per ton. What range are we talking about now with existing technologies? It's a great question, and it's almost too early to say what the actual range of what they cost is because they're all very nascent and at a small scale. What we have seen is that there's been this great movement in the voluntary corporate carbon credit purchasing space out of the very low cost um, offsets that we've seen over the past decade into a, the complete other end of the spectrum where groups like the Frontier Fund are paying between $200 and $2,000 a ton for carbon removal credits that come directly from the atmosphere and can demonstrate really high permanence. I think that's an interesting data point if you take $200 to $2,000 a ton and you say it could come down by a factor of 10 or more all of a sudden we're at that roughly $100 a ton range that we think is necessary to bring this technology to commercial adoption at that gigaton scale needed to matter for the climate. If I could do the footnote on that because some of the audience isn't gonna know what Frontier Fund is about. Could you just say a word about which, which, what you're referencing? Sorry, there's a handful of uh, corporate sustainability initiatives that have been announced recently to purchase atmospheric carbon removal the Frontier Fund is one led by Stripe, a number of the tech companies, um, largely in the Bay Area. They've announced a billion dollar advanced market commitment to purchasing carbon removal. Uh, the advanced market commitment is a, a not common, but a, a known structure that folks have used in the global health world to stimulate vaccine deployment. This is basically saying companies will buy a billion dollars worth of atmospheric carbon removal in order to get the field to start investing in the supply. Because right now, that billion dollars of purchases is actually ahead of where the field is. We're still building systems at the roughly 1,000 ton per year scale today. And so the appetite for purchasing carbon removal is bigger than the demand. Though that is going to need to fairly quickly shift if we're talking about billions of tons of carbon, the gigaton level that's been mentioned, that is the unit that we think of that's going to move the needle for climate. Give me one more. So the Frontier Fund puts money where their mouth is in terms of carbon removal. What's the money where their mouth is element in the federal government? Like what part of IRA or other uh, funding streams or other support for CC, uh, CDR um, is sitting underneath your office or elsewhere in the government? Yeah, it's a great question. And so uh, my background is I started a, a nonprofit organization focused on, on carbon removal. Back in 2015, we went to Congress and said, hey, we need some money for carbon removal. They said, how about $250,000 for a report? And we said, great. And that was government support for carbon removal uh, to the time immemorial. We now have, through both the infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, billions of dollars of support with a B, which I think if folks on this panel, we would have said something like that in 2015, that by 2023, we'd be at billions of support for this field. People would have been a little, at least a little skeptical, if not uh, just laughed us out of the room. Yet here we are. There's 
uh, billions of dollars of grant funding for direct air capture hubs. We're going to build 4,000, or sorry, million ton per year direct air capture hubs in the US with uh, billions of dollars through the infrastructure law. And there's something called the 45Q tax credit which again, sorry for the, the acronyms, but the IRS will, will not let us uh, avoid them in this scenario. There's $180 a ton for direct air capture and storage that is uncapped. If you are able to sequester a, a thousand tons or a billion tons, the US government will pay you $180 per ton of direct air captured CO2. So saying what the amount of support is, via that tax credit is kind of up to industry. If they can figure out how to unlock that tax credit, it could literally be in the, the billions of dollars for that provision alone. And time will tell how quickly the innovation catches up to that market incentive. Is that only for DAC or is that for all kinds of CDR? Uh, alas, it's, it's only for direct air capture um, at the, the $180 a ton level. There is a lower credit value for capturing CO2 from a point source, which in most cases is a fossil-derived uh, emission source. So think of your power plant, your cement kiln, any type of existing industrial facility. That gets an $85 a ton credit. If you use biomass, and that biomass is grown sustainably, the carbon capture associated with that can result in a net negative overall life cycle. It's a lot of ifs, but there, there is certainly is funding there. I think the rest of the carbon removal community is currently working with Congress to figure out how to say what we want as a community is carbon removal, not necessarily direct air capture technology. How do we broaden that 45Q tax credit? That's gonna take Congress to, to act Congress is not going to act again on uh, this topic for the indefinite future, but I'm optimistic that over time we'll move to a subsidy regime that's a pathway agnostic approach, uh, very much like the uh, current administration's approach in the carbon negative shot, which says we want an outcome of carbon removal. We're going to explore a wide range of pathways that can get us from where we are today to that outcome. Ramsey, over to you for a little bit. Um, I think every carbon removal company in the world knows of the Grantham Foundation. So you probably see virtually all the deal flow, or a lot of the deal flow. Tell us about everything that comes across your desk. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, but but how, much, how much, how many ventures are you seeing in this space in total? And I know you invest in about 65, but just give us a sense of the space. Well, I apologize to anyone whose email uh, I have not responded to. If you're in the room, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that, well, I'll back up a little bit. This, the penny dropped for us in about 2016. Uh, we saw a pitch from uh, a, a different seaweed-focused uh, entrepreneur. Um, it seemed a little crazy at the time, um, but afterwards we we really thought long and hard about the the inevitability of, of needing this kind of solution at scale. So that, that, that was about when the penny dropped for us that this was coming and we maybe had a role to play. And I think all along our frame was that, um, you know, absent any intervention, what, what human nature and, and what humans will do is nothing until there's a gun at your head, right? And so we saw this coming and our sense was, well, let's see, this is probably gonna take 10 or 15 years for the rest of the world to figure this out, probably. Um, and no one's gonna really do much, certainly not at scale. Until then, it's gonna take another 15 or 10 or 15 years at least to figure out what might we scale. Um, and that's gonna be too long. And so if we can start this process of trying things, get ideas out of labs, help companies get started, let's try try to put this in practice so that when that day comes that there is a price signal, and now we have a price signal, um, the beginnings of it at least, um, that, that we have things that are ready. So that was all along our, our approach. So we set up a, a sort of a, a captive in-house uh, venture pool uh, we called Neglected Climate Opportunities. And so carbon removal was one of a few themes. We also were at the time um, of a similar view that, uh, that, that methane emissions were overlooked and in, in need of activity. So uh, we had a few themes. 
And um, so we just started taking pitches and networking and talking to experts and who do you, what's our question of uh, pretty much anyone we could find is, what's the most transformative thing that you've seen, regardless of how likely it is to actually work? What, what have you seen that would be amazing and exciting if it worked? And let's at least hear about it. It doesn't mean we necessarily want to fund a check, um, write a check, but it lists, let's at least hear it out. And I think over time, we've, we built up a network of experts, technical experts, market experts, and got a better feel for uh, what were the promising pathways. Um, and we, as a team, have done a fair amount of venture investing and, and have a sense for what are the key characteristics of promising venture teams and, and CEOs. So, um, and I mentioned the four buckets. We sort of developed that framework and began sort of mapping the landscape, what are the different pathways, so that we could make sense of, of, of the deal flow as it came in. And so, but the deal flow that you see, you know, are you seeing hundreds of these ventures, thousands of these ventures, scores of these ventures? You know, the, in the four buckets, are you seeing kind of uh, more tendency towards one bucket or another? I'll tell you why I'm asking the question. If you look overall at, at venture funding, you know, kind of, I could have put up a chart, but you know, here's the distribution of venture funding by category. And then here's the emissions needs. It doesn't really line up at all, right? You know, so there's a lot of money going to a couple of things that really aren't the biggest emissions emitters. And then there's some big emitters that aren't getting a whole lot of money. So I'm just trying to understand again the space and you know where you see people doing, trying to do work, and does that correspond to what you think the right solutions are? Right. That's a great question. Um, I, I think again uh, the neglected frame was important for us because I think as a as a mission driven organization, that we're a foundation, we have a charitable mission to basically do everything we can uh, uh, to arrest climate change. Um, for, for us, we didn't want to compete with the established venture funds, be they the generalists who are sniffing around or the more specialist climate tech funds, um, in, in which case for the latter group, we're often investors as a, as a limited partner in their funds. Uh, we, did, we wanted to be careful not to compete with them. We from time to time would co-invest with them but so this neglected frame was important to us, and that's exactly what we saw, that there was really at the time um, really almost no activity. So um, we've, we've, I, I guess what we've seen is that the direct air capture has gotten the most attention and I think is maybe one of the more um, active fields, and we're on the margin going forward, I think, doing less of that. And I think for us, that neglected frame, the goalposts are constantly moving. Um, now, given the macro environment and, uh, as Jeremy's called it, the super bubble, and if it's unwinding and that unwinding is serious, um, maybe the goalposts will move, will move back, but um, we're starting to look for places where maybe there's enough other people interested that we can back off and let these things um, go uh, progress without us. Um, yeah. So just so we all understand, you're a philanthropic venture capitalist, is that? Yes. Interesting concept. <laughs> uh, we're trying to be uh, innovative. I guess what I would say is, we're, I guess it came, it came from, well, it's been an interest of mine all along throughout my, my career, but I guess our feeling was excited as we are about our grant making. I think we're quite aware that our grant making alone is not sufficient. And here we have uh, an endowment, and luckily for us, it's a large endowment, and we have the possibility, we have the, the potential to put that capital to work in line with and in service of our mission. Now, our true aspiration is actually to take a lot more risk than anybody else is willing to, and in the end, as Jeremy bragged earlier, our performance so far has been great. Now, maybe it's just because of the lack of market market, but over the full term, our aspiration is to actually win because we want to be early, but we want, in the end, uh, we want to back companies that have a shot at scaling and eventually some of which we hope will. And I think both of you got some money from them. Full disclosure, right? Um, Actually, so, so did Noah in his uh, prior nonprofit uh, <laughs> days. And, and I can just give a, a context about how the startup field has, has grown too. I think 2008 or so, Richard Branson on the heels of the Space X Prize launched a carbon removal X Prize, far before anyone was really thinking about this. I think they had maybe a dozen finalists, and that was the field for 
the next 10 years or so. You said 2016 was the first pitch that you've heard. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of efforts out there today around the world working on different pieces of this puzzle. And so I, I think it's no longer possible to literally get all of the people working on this in a single room, uh, which is just a, a very exciting... Uh, we're seeing that bell curve actually start to balance out a little bit more, and there is a field to, to speak of. Yeah, and to that point, we, we with the foundation hat, um, we funded incubators specifically focused on carbon removal in Paris, in London, in San Francisco, and there's act uh, there's some in Australia. There's there's activity on this topic everywhere. Maybe Boston next, but who knows? Um, so so far, Running Tide and Travertine Technologies are not household names. In time, they will be. So. I was going to ask Laura and Marty to explain a little bit about their businesses, because we need to understand it from the top down, which is what you just heard, but also from the bottom up. What's it like to create one of these businesses? What are the challenges? What's the fundamental science you work with? So Laura, why don't you get us started? Explain to us what Travertine Technologies is all about and you know how it came to be and what the big challenges and opportunities are that you see in front of you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to be on this panel. Um, and I also, before I get into Travertine, just want to say I love the philanthropic venture model because I think there is the opportunity to develop these collaborative synergies early on um, that maybe wouldn't arise out of just a purely financial VC. So I think that's great. Um, so my background is in geochemistry. Uh, I've been in academia for most of my career. I started out in my uh, dissertation one of the first uh, subsurface uh, geologic carbon sequestration research consortia that was back at Stanford University and, um, and, and UC Berkeley. And, um, and you know, in the, in the last 10 years since then, uh, it hasn't seemed like there, there is a, was a there there or an opportunity uh, to develop a, a commercially viable strategy for large-scale carbon removal and sequestration. Uh, but then my PhD students started graduating, and I was training them in carbon mineralization, and then they started getting jobs in <laughs> carbon mineralization companies <laughs> and carbon sequestration companies. And then one of them pointed me to the Frontier Fund and said, we got Frontier Fund money. And I said, what is that? They give you <laughs> pre-purchase carbon removal credits? Are you kidding me? Um, and so uh, in tandem, had been working on a process in my lab uh, to, to deal with uh, chemical waste from critical element extraction industries. And so uh, the timing felt right to, to leave my position and start Travertine. So we were founded a year ago, early stage company, just for context. So what Travertine does, the Travertine process, takes uh, chemical waste, sulfate waste from uh, mining and fertilizer production, and then converts them into carbon removal and permanent sequestration through mineral formation. So this is essentially a, a, a highly accelerated version of what the Earth does over geologic time scales to regulate CO2 in the atmospheres over kind of hundreds of millions of years. And then um, in addition to that, we take that waste and turn it back into commodity chemicals that are inputs to the extractive process. And so what that does, it eliminates a waste product from the extraction um, and allows us to basically eliminate the need to import feedstocks for that uh, chemical extraction process. And so uh, we have some co-benefits, co the waste reduction, uh, the basically the revenue streams from commodity chemical production, uh, and then also our ability to permanently sequester CO2 in those solid carbonate phases. And so when we're thinking about uh, building a business model, we want a couple of attributes to our business. So the first is that it's got to be profitable. Um, the second is that it has to be resilient. So uh, in, in, in the face of uh, a little bit of uncertainty around uh, voluntary carbon markets, we want to be building, or compliance markets for that matter, we want to be building a, bi a business that could potentially uh, eliminate the need for revenue from uh, carbon removal credits, although that will be hard. Um, and then we want it to be scalable, okay? And so uh, what we, uh, the way that we've uh, basically approached this is to uh, go after basically the largest producers of critical elements, so the, the major miners, the major fertilizer producers, and um, have started to take their waste feedstocks and integrate them in our process and evaluate the feasibility of these products for permanent mineralization and storage. And so that gets us to the, the scalability piece. Um, in terms of price, I mean, I think, uh, you know, our, our target, of course, is a, as low as reasonably possible. Uh, but uh, I think to achieve something sub $100 per ton carbon dioxide removal and sequestration, uh, we would need to have a low-cost renewable energy supply. And so there, there are these... 
um, there are these feedback loops, right? We need critical elements to drive the re renewable energy transition, and then we need renewable energy to be able to uh, affordably uh, implement carbon dioxide removal and permanent sequestration at a scale that is required uh, to avoid catastrophic climate warming. So um, we're really excited to be on this path. And, and so I understand. Uh, one of the things you, you said in there is you wanted to be resilient so you're not dependent on voluntary carbon markets, or, and you do that because basically you can sell a process within a firm. So or maybe I misunderstood. So in, um, in an ideal world, we would be if sufficiently efficient that the sale of our commodity products, so sulfuric acid, green hydrogen, could pay the entire cost of the process, and also taking into account the cost of waste elimination and uh, uh, eliminating a liability on balance sheet. Uh, realistically, with our efficiency today and the way that we're projecting our scale up, uh, you know, we're going to start somewhere in the several hundred dollars per ton and hopefully achieve sub hundred dollars per ton, um, you know, within a decade. But it's, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, I, I, I would aspire to having um, CDR for free. Marty, your story is a little different. Yeah, let's hear it. Um, okay, so, um, well, first, uh, Running Tide uses uh, the ocean to remove carbon through the two uh, pathways that the ocean removes carbon, moving biomass from surface ocean to the deep sea. We use macroalgae to do that, so seaweed, um, and then also um, weathering of alkaline materials. So. Uh, shifting the balance of kind of the carbonate cycle in the ocean. So there's, we use just natural pathways and try to nudge them forward. Um, we built the company on the premise that, you know, earth scale problems require earth scale solutions. So um, trying to kind of nudge the natural processes forward. Um, how, how we started, um, so I, <laughs> <laughs> long story uh Good short time the sh yeah <laughs> short version of it is a uh, um you know i grew up and worked in the fishing industry um had a career in engineering um you know worked at columbia university uh at one point and came across uh klaus lochner's artificial trees which was like early direct air capture in 2008 uh instantly clicked in my head i was like okay this is the path uh like i want to spend my life uh you know stopping global warming from destroying everything good. Um, so start, that was started a long journey for me of going through all the different uh, carbon removal systems I could see. Um, you know, coming from an industrial background, I was like really focused on, okay, how do I scale? What does it take to scale? Um, um, kind of generally had an abhorrence of high capex stuff. Um, so we really looked for, wow, okay, what are the most efficient ways, not just from OPEX, but from CAPEX, um, long journey, actually, you know, despite my background, uh, came to the ocean last, probably because I know how hard it is uh, to work in, but um, eventually ended up with the ocean because the ocean is the greatest carbon remover of all time. It's kind of the center of the climate, uh, the, the Earth's uh, carbon cycle, and so I felt like that was the way to angle of attack. Um, so 2016, um, you know, through had the opportunity to start m my company running Tide, and we were really focused on, okay, how do we build measurement systems? Uh, this is like the big challenge for using uh, open systems, um, you know, nature deployed systems, is how do you measure? Like, we know the Earth, the Earth is a giant direct air capture machine, you just have to know how to operate it, so um, you need to have that feedback from the Earth system, like, okay, I'm doing this, am I getting carbon removal out of it? Um, so. 2016, we started started building quantification systems for uh, you know n uh, nutrient movement in the ocean. Uh, 2020 came around, and it was like this amazing gift from the heavens that um, Stripe and Shopify put out these RFPs for carbon removal, um, and we were able to you know take the company that was aimed towards carbon removal. But he was right; it was going to be 15 years. That was like my my plan from 2016 was 15 years from now we do carbon removal. 2020 happened, those RFPs came out, I met, I met the Grantham Foundation, we were able to get really 
pivot onto carbon removal and focus on it and take all these, this cool tech that we've built about measuring things in the ocean and start applying it directly to carbon removal. And, um, you know, we've been able to continue to sell credits, stand up an operation in Iceland. We got a research permit in Iceland. Um, now we have 65 engineers and 15 PhDs working, um, working on this and developing a lot of very cool uh, technologies to help measure. And now we're getting into carbon removal operations in the ocean. So, yeah. And when, for both of you, when you think about scale, how, it, obviously scale is a curve. So where are the critical points in that curve and how long is it gonna take you to get there under your current trajectory? Is that a reasonable question or is there, maybe you could think of a better way to frame it, but I'm just trying to understand the trajectory of, of where you're both headed. Okay, so I think this is one thing that I think people miss is that carbon removal is going to the, be the biggest transfer of mass in human history. So it's actually, you had to move less mass to emit the carbon than you did, we were gonna have to do to pull it down. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be moving you know, if you want to know the scale of the carbon removal industry, like look outside and everything you see is emitting carbon. We basically have to do everything you see, like all industry and like to reverse it. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, in, in, it's, there's a, it, breaks peop, it breaks my mind every day when you think about how much mass we're going to have to move. There's one trillion tons of excess carbon in the fast cycle that we have to move down to the slow cycle. Fast cycle, slow cycle, could you just explain that? Oh, yeah. Uh, so... What did we do when we emitted all this carbon? We dug up carbon from the slow cycle, emitted it to the fast cycle. The fast cycle is atmosphere and upper layer of the ocean. We've acidified the ocean. We've made the atmosphere trap a bunch of heat. Now we have to move it out of the atmosphere and upper layer of the ocean and move it back down to the slow cycle. Um, that's just like a really a shorthand way of defining carbon removal. And um, it's, you know, it's a trillion tons. So that's a, a lot of material. Um, and, and, th and that's just a trillion tons of carbon. You have to do things to get the carbon to move. And sometimes you have to move a lot more mass than that um, in order to get the carbon, like, you know, whether- So that's the scale carbon. at the planetary level, but for your businesses, oh, 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 all right, what do you see as scale points that you're gonna hit over time in terms of quantities, prices? How do, how do you think that for you, for Running Tide and for Travertine are gonna evolve? So yeah, I think so. Uh, as a as an early stage company with an eye to uh, survival over the next decade, uh, we need to think about our our approach to scale. Uh, whether it is uh, jumping immediately uh, from uh, pilot or small commercial scale facilities to uh, a magnitude of an operation that would be replacing what is today a conventional sulfur burner plant, basically. So doing uh, extractive industries in a different way. Uh, and, and the the upside of that is uh, it's it's a, a fast path to scale. But the downside of that uh, from a small company's perspective is that um, there's a lot of finance risk in building a $500 million plant, right? We're less capital efficient than uh, Marty's uh, technology. And so um, what that means for us is that uh, we need to be creative about strategies for uh, developing revenue streams from smaller scale uh, commercial facilities in the meantime. Uh, and Again, we're early stage, so we're we're still building this, and I'm and I'm open to your advice. So please. <laughs> well, and I can say how the the DOE has thought about this in the past, which is one order of magnitude scale at a time. So today, rough order of magnitude, we're building thousand ton per year carbon removal systems. That scaling factor, one order at a time. We have to get to million ton direct air capture hubs by the end of the decade. And then again to billions of tons of an industry shortly there thereafter. So each one of those levels de-risks a certain amount of technical, financial, and broader projects. So whether that's social or permitting or other types of risks across that that spectrum. The one thing that changes in that is if the module size that you are building is very small. Think about a, a solar panel is, is not big. Once you figure out how to manufacture that small module, it's no longer a question of can you build a system that's big? It's can you build a manufacturing supply chain that's big? So all of a sudden you're thinking about a different question. However, most of the systems that we are looking at today in carbon removal world are 
ones that benefit from an economy of scale and have a fairly large module at the end of the day. And so working through that one order of magnitude at a time scaling, I think is really important. And we have uh, unfortunately a long history of DOE at not listening to that rule and have gotten into trouble in the past with trying to go too big too soon in other energy technologies and in point source carbon capture in the past. And so we've absolutely learned those lessons and are trying our best to stick to that engineering scale up in a way that is as quick as is reasonable given all of the different uh, intermingled risks. And for Noah and Ramsey, as you look across all these technologies, are some of them more promising than others in terms of, say, their scientific merit, the engineering possibilities of them? Or do we need to pursue all of them all at once? Well, I think from our perspective, um, I don't think we're, we'd have the answer yet. Okay. So I, th I think in general, we are still um, trying to cultivate options, I would say. Now, there are, there are many approaches that look to us to be dead ends just on a thermodynamic basis. Maybe it's just the basics of how much material you're handling or the energetics of you know, uh, grabbing carbon and then releasing it. Some of that can be just showstopper type stuff. So um, it's not any and everything is fair game. Uh, we're, we're selective, but still um, broadly um, exploring and trying to cultivate lots of different shots on goal. If you had asked me the, the question earlier, A, B, C, or D, a decade ago, I would have decidedly been in the D category. Every time I think I get closer to, to A, I learn that I'm actually in D and that there's way more to go. So if anybody answered anything besides D, I, I, we need to, to check that. I think you're always going to find that we don't know. And so having that humility, I don't think every solution makes sense. We can clearly tell what we think is a silly bet based on engineering, thermodynamics, right? We, we know some things don't make sense, but there are a lot of things that might not make sense today that are going to look really good in the future for reasons that we can't anticipate today. And I think we're seeing that across the clean energy spectrum, not just in the, the carbon removal space. And so we're trying to keep options on the table, which means investing in a lot of pathways, even if the probability is low, if you have a big enough portfolio, that portfolio itself is going to have uh, a high chance of success. Yeah, please. Um, so just as a, as a climate entrepreneur, I, I'd love to add to this that I, I think we all have a vested interest in as many of these ventures succeeding as, as possible because we want to be able to tackle the climate crisis and it's a, an enormous uh, magnitude, tr a trillion tons of, of carbon is a lot. Um, and in addition to that, the Earth system is uh, complicated and there are feedbacks that we don't understand. And so if we take little slices of perturbations of the Earth system to drive CO2 uptake uh, in different areas, you know, a little bit in the oceans, a little bit on land, a, a little bit in the biosphere, uh, that might reduce uh, the likelihood of, of um, unexpected feedbacks that, that could be detrimental. And the last thing I'll add here is we heard earlier this morning that um, uh, all politics is, is local. I don't think we're going to have a one-size-fits-all carbon removal solution. Running tide is not going to work in Wyoming. Travertine might. <laughs> and I think it's important to recognize that if we are able to have incentives for carbon removal, there are going to be lots of opportunities to do that depending on where you are, and we should have technologies that offer a diversity of pathways to get where we need to go. It sounds like we got where we are now in part because of great science and some other things, but Frontier and Stripe has come up a couple of times. Were it not for that, sounds like you'd still be in a lab, um, maybe. Um, um, <laughs> okay, yeah. fine. Yeah, we're in labs but that's, time, yeah. in some sense, you know, <laughs> can we depend, because that's a voluntary private sector activity, which is quasi-philanthropic in nature. I don't know how to describe it. Um, were it not for that, would we be where we are? Or in DAC? 180 bucks, a, you know, kind of a ton, all right? So maybe that's encouraging some DAC. So is it only the happenstance of that deal that we're seeing as much stuff as we are? Or what's, what's going to drive the next generation or the, the continued development of this? Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, the, the, I mean, companies have, uh, okay, companies have carbon emissions on their balance sheet mm -hmm. now, right? The, it, or SEC disclosures. Mm -hmm. uh, you can think of, like, the carbon emissions uh, that's a liability on the balance sheet. And 
you know, they're, they have to remove it. They have to remove the, the liability from their balance sheet. At some point, that's going to become a, a realized cost. And you can see companies like Apple mm -hmm. says by, you know, they, I just read their report, and they say by 2030, they're going to have, um, they're going to require eight megatons of removals in order to hit their net, their mm -hmm. net zero targets. And this is like Apple we're talking about. Okay. It's like probably, you know, one of the best companies ever. Um, highly incentivized to decarbonize, that's the best they can do. They're going to need eight tons of removals in order to remove that liability off their balance sheet. Um, pretty much every company is a carbon emitter, and they're all going to have these liabilities. And I think that that's where the next tranche of funding comes from. Um, I mean, like, no one wants to give me some money to do this. I'll do it. But like, um, I think for the most part, it's going to come from corporations who are trying to remove these liabilities from their balance sheet. So that assumes that A, corporations have real incentives to do that, <coughs> and B, that there's a credible way to use your products and verifiably get rid of their carbon emissions. Yeah. Not get rid of, but offset their carbon emissions. Yeah. How realistic do you think those two assumptions are? J can I just yeah? throw in, I, I mean, I think that um, companies are starting to put internal prices on carbon, um, thinking forward to this uh, change in perspective that we all understand that we need to tackle this climate crisis and likely down the road there will be a liability that's a, a financial liability but today is not really right because there's no there's no real penalty and so I, I think you know this is this is a real problem from a scale-up perspective in the sense that I'm not going to be able to finance a plant on the theory of a potential compliance market 10 years from now right and so we need to actually put regulations in place and, and set up a price on carbon. Right. Let's open it up to you all for your questions. Um, when you ask your questions, there's little buttons in front of you on the mics. If you can just press those, and the mic will light up. I think you had your hand yeah, up first. Sure. Hi. Um, Stacy Gifford. I'm at IBM. Um, I once had a life in carbon removal research, so I'm, I'm asking this question because I'm rooting for you, not because I'm an enemy. But I'm curious around the verifiability of carbon credits. So there's been, I think, the general public the skepticism comes around the verifiability, especially around biological credits. I think the science, at least in my opinion, for like mineralization is pretty sound. Um, but there's been like some criticism even around like the 45Q tax credit. There's been some reports that there's like some fraudulent claims there. And I'm just curious, like in your opinion, what are what's the path to getting like true verifiability around carbon credits so that when companies are required to close their net zero gap with these types of credits, they feel comfortable that they're actually doing it in a meaningful way and they're not just greenwashing. Can I chime in here? So uh, this is a huge problem. Uh, the, the carbon markets are collapsing because there's no trust. If there's no trust in the market, it's not, it, it's not gonna last. And so um, I think right now uh, we're in this period of, of transition where it's being reformed and uh, all around the idea that we need uh, really robust uh, monitoring and verification of carbon credits. And so I, I would recommend that you check out the website Carbon Plan uh, that is trying to establish kind of high level guidelines around uh, verification protocols for different carbon removal pathways. Um, and they're working directly with suppliers to, to kind of flesh out uh, any sources of uncertainty. And I think the objective would be in the long run to say that we have a fungible carbon credit price that we discount based on a level of uncertainty, for example, or a, a, a lower level of permanence. Great. More questions. Um, let's go over here. Uh, yes. Thanks. Um, in the category of unintended consequences, what could possibly go wrong with putting um, all this carbon removal and using the ocean, for example? What, what is the impact on you know, ocean life? Um, well, I can tell you firsthand that ocean life is in complete collapse right now, like Understood. full on. We're, yeah. Gulf of Maine has seen a 66% drop in phytoplankton. So that's that through the trophic cascade, that's a 90% drop in like uh, fish, for instance. Um, so you have to, ca uh, you know, characterize everything against the baseline of like total devastation and collapse. And then um, on top of that, you know, for instance, our activity, you know, the biological pump exists. You get gigatons of carbon flux to the bottom of the ocean every year, and that is slowing down. So for a long time, our activity is just going to be restoring that like uh, flow of calories that historically has been present. And, um, you know, between now and when we start to exceed whatever historic baseline is, we're going to be gathering more information. You know, Running Tide right now is gathering 
tremendous amounts of information from our network of sensors that are out in the ocean, and we'll just know what's happening at a level of resolution that we've never had. And, um, you know, this incredibly, incredibly low risk of, um, you know, for instance, like biologic material floating to the deep ocean causing a problem, like you feed some critters that are calorie starved. Um, and, but, you know, look, over the next 10 years, we're going to learn a lot about the ocean, 15, 20 years, and we'll be able to, you know, grab, put our hands on the dials. There's a lot of degrees of freedom inside of all these systems, and we'll, we'll tune it one way or the other. Um, our system specifically um, has been designed to have, like, you know, massive dispersion. So we're not taking a bunch of macroalgae and, like, dumping it in a pile in the bottom of the ocean. We like, spread it out over huge areas. So... Um, I think there's, and you know, we're working with some of the best ocean scientists, benthic researchers in the world, best, um, you know, oceans, Ocean Networks Canada, Ocean Frontiers Institute, Monterey Bay Aquarium, a whole suite of uh, academic partners to kind of study all of this. But um, I think there's incredibly low risk t to these ecosystems that would do any like any damage, and I think it's very high likelihood that if you do nothing, everything dies. And that's like, it, it's harsh, but like everything's on its way out, so. So, and I, th I think from a DOE perspective, we recognize that anything done at scale, whether it's carbon removal or clean energy or any other type of system is going to have societal and environmental impacts, both positive and negative. And for the first time as a department, we are actually requiring people that want our funding to have plans for these things. So that is, I, I think, a recognition that that question is very valid. I think we're all confident that, yes, there are going to be impacts of doing anything at scale. And yes, with the right attention to that, we can solve that. It doesn't mean that it will get solved just by its own, uh, if you have an incentive for carbon removal, things could go very bad. But if we have an incentive in a context of everyone working on carbon removal is only here because of a climate mission and mandate. And so it's been very heartening to see the whole community really think about a broad spectrum of what those impacts are going to be across a number of different environmental and social dimensions and how to have a as many benefits and to minimize any of the negative impacts as we can across those projects. And can I just add to this? I, I think per public perception of risk is maybe one of the biggest barriers to adoption of a lot of these technologies, uh, which means that we need to be implementing large-scale field trials so we can actually understand what the ecosystem impacts are uh, because there are complicated feedback. The Earth system is complicated, but we won't understand that until we actually make measurements. Uh, and so I, I think we shouldn't let a fear of risk uh, stop us from doing the, the work to understand what the true risks are. Questions. Uh, how about uh, the gentleman three rows down? Yes, you. So I have a price incentive um, question. When 45Q was getting scored for its impact on the budget, the estimates were around $4 billion. I'm now seeing revenue losses uh, by Bloomberg New Energy Finance at $100 billion or more. And I guess my question is mostly for NOAA. Um, my concern is that you create such a, a lucrative revenue stream associated with carbon capture that you're going to extend the life of carbon intensive industries and impede the entry of cleaner alternatives. And I'm w wondering if you can talk about how DOE is thinking about that and how you're going to prevent it. Yeah, it's a, a great question. And this applies mostly outside of the carbon removal context and in the carbon mitigation context. But it's a, a valid question. And in any analysis that we've done, the actual incentives for all of the other clean energy technologies are so much more lucrative on the, the point source technology side that only a small fraction of the existing industry, largely newer and in industries that are harder to electrify with renewable energy, especially in the industrial sector like cement, steel, petrochem, et cetera, Places where there are inherent process emissions associated with it, in the near term, that's where we're going to see the bulk of the, the incentive lead to projects. We're not going to see the renewable energy industry slow down because of the 45Q tax credit. And we actually see, if you think about it in a way, you can help accelerate the adoption of renewable energy 
by thinking of carbon management systems as yet another demand response tool and one that can help build overall system reliability, minimize some of the, the cost and land footprint from going from like 80% renewable to 100%. That's that last mile there that looks increasingly challenging from a cost efficiency standpoint where this 45Q tax credit on the existing emission sources can have the greatest impacts overall. Great. Thank you. So Laura Korb with McKinsey. We were a founding member of Frontier along with Alphabet Meta, Shopify, and Stripe. And we're thrilled that in the last month, JP Morgan, Autodesk, H&M, and Workday have joined. And I just want to extend an invitation if there are any corporates out here in the audience. A billion dollars is a great start, but it's just a start. And so come join us in a big commitment by 2030. We can fund a lot of startups like what you see from Marty and Laura, and this is one of these situations, the more the merrier. Great, thank you. Yes. Uh, question for Marty and Laura. I'm curious, as you guys start to go and try to sell... Sorry, old habits. Uh, it, as you guys go and start to sell some of these credits and talk to buyers, I'm curious if you've found appetite for alternative financing structures, you know, futures contracts, insurance on these credits, et cetera, because I know it's great to go and sell to the, the Frontier Fund, but I'm curious uh, if you guys have any insights into what customers are open to or if you guys have things you've tried to suggest in terms of, like, just counteracting the deflationary effect of a ton costs 500 bucks today maybe, but if you buy it in 2030, it's 150 and I know... We have some in-between vehicles here with the Frontier Fund, et cetera, but I'm curious if you guys have put stuff out to, to buyers or if they've come back, anything to structure these things in a weird way. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's like, you know, half the job is to try to understand the demand side. Um, I think that at least from the, the signal that buyers are sending to us is that, um, you know, the demand is going to be there. I think most people see this as an inevitability. Like, you know, the, like, you know, high durability removals are where the market is going to go. And um, a lot of, so a lot of companies are interested in like, okay, how do I secure that supply? You know, if, and I think that some are looking at this as, uh, you know, it's their, it's their license to operate, freedom to operate is, is securing enough supply in the future. So imagine, you know, you have this, you're going to build a big asset. It's going to emit carbon for the you know 30 years. If 10 years from now removals become compliance, okay, how do you, how as like a risk manager, how do you assess that? And like, okay, well, you need to have some removals in your portfolio or guaranteed so that you can you know mitigate that risk slightly that you won't be able to operate this um, piece of equipment or whatever as it emits carbon. Um, so I think that there's a there's a kind of most of the people we talk to are kind of like, okay, it's coming, we don't know when. We know we're gonna need supply, so we're interested in talking to people early. Um, you know, and I think for the most part, it all comes down to like, hey, when, whenever you can pass audit, like whenever you have a credit that can pass audit and is like validated by kind of, you know, you're meeting industry standards, et cetera, like they'll start to purchase. Um, the insurance question is really interesting because I, I, an insurance market hasn't emerged around credits, carbon removal credits, but I definitely, I mean, that's, going to be a massive part of this um, moving forward. Um, so, yeah. I, I think I would add to that, uh, we're not as far along, but I, I would say that um, I, I, we're, we're interested in, in sort of partnerships and joint ventures in which uh, a mining company, for example, would want to retire credits internally and would take it upon themselves to uh, finance part of a plant, for example, uh, which would effectively be um, subsidizing the, the price of carbon removal. And so, uh, also, you know, rectifier transformer supplier saying, you know, well, maybe we could do some kind of in-kind transaction where we can write off some, some uh, emissions if we help you build a system. So, just, uh, uh, you know, I, I think it's a little bit uh, open. Yeah, it's 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 like, it's 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 a trick. It's not really a market because it's so supply constrained, right? It's like so supply constrained that there's no actual, there's not really any liquidity around these credits or anything. So. There's quite a bit of maturation before you can really start to say these things are like a tradable asset. But that said, 
any financial innovation that pulls cash into startups now so that they can build supply, extremely valuable. I know we don't have the yeah. answer for that. Go. <laughs> Maybe Harvard Business School can figure it out, but. Yeah. So one more question. Uh, well, one in the front, yes. So uh, this is a question for Ramsey. Um, do you see any technologies that um, are not dependent on fluctuating commodity prices, uh, intensive capex, um, also uh, consumer behavior that will buy those products that that you know that that has been uh, removed from carbon, so price price increased prices, and the fourth is government subsidies. So do you see any technologies? that are very fast into commercialization in carbon removal? Well, I think the, I, th I think to my comments before about it no longer feeling neglected, the industrial direct air capture systems, I think that's the most mature segment of this market. Um, it's, it's closed looped, um, you know, it's a pretty, you engineer a system, you can track what goes in and what goes out so the, the verifiability is strong and depending on, on the sequestration opportunity, that's uh, fairly, can be fairly straightforward. Um, so it's, it feels to us like those, those things are happening. The, the DOE has funds for these hubs, and I think within all of the IRA and the infrastructure bill, um, there are pockets that allow for deployment of relatively novel technologies. Uh, there are some more established direct air capture technologies that we feel are a bit more expensive and maybe, and we're not, a, great interest to us because it didn't seem to have a cost reduction trajectory that got us excited. Um, but so some of those first plants are getting built at that thousand ton-ish scale. So I, I think the most traction and momentum at this point is in that industrial direct air capture uh, segment of the market. But uh, I think the, the, real, the, the real scaling, that next order of magnitude or two, um, that may be hard to come by. Those are going to be very expensive plants. Raising the, the project finance money for that is going to be very difficult. Um, so I, I think it's still a closely run race across all the different technologies. Uh, and to their comments, we aren't too close to the customer side on the demand side. Um, we've been really, maybe to Marty's comment, really focused on just getting more ideas for supply uh, started. So we're out of time, but before I thank the panel, I want to go back to Jeremy's comment in the plenary session. So if I got your numbers right, to remove, say, you know, 300 parts per million is three teratons times, say, 50 bucks a, a ton is a $150 trillion market. Um, now, maybe Jeremy was off by a factor of 100. Um, it's still a pretty big market. Um, and more important than the market size is that that is the difference between a planet that is more livable and less livable. So we're, I think, seeing the maybe 16, 17 was the very beginning of this market, but I think we are seeing something that's going to be incredibly important, not only in our lifetimes, but in the lifetimes of a couple of generations of folks who are going to be going through this school and many other schools. I'd like to thank Ramsey, Noah, Laura, and Marty for their for their great work, but also for their participation in today's panel. Thank you.